Hello, everyone. My name is John Simonek, and I'm a security consultant at NCC Group in our hardware and embedded security services team. And we work with product engineering teams to identify gaps in the security posture of their products, which are typically embedded systems, and uh, help them find vulnerabilities and remediate them. Today, I'll be speaking about uh, my experience with guiding these teams to uh, using and deploying U-Boot more securely and some of the, the pitfalls that uh, these people tend to encounter when, when working with uh, U-Boot. A little bit about myself. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a security consultant in NCC Group. Um, I've always been someone who's been really passionate and interested in open source software. Um, I've always loved reverse engineering, tinkering, and, and learning more about Linux, U-Boot, uh, the Octo ecosystem. And um, I was first introduced to U-Boot back in 2011 when I was doing some contract engineering work where I was porting it to some custom platforms. And overall, I really enjoyed the experiences. Uh, it taught me a lot. Um, the process of debugging and, and learning more about code base was something I really valued. And so it has a U-Boot has a special place in my heart in many ways. The goals of this talk and what I'd like you to take away from it is um, just to get some insight into where companies tend to struggle with deploying U-Boot securely. And um, I'm gonna try to highlight some of the areas in which security professionals tend to provide guidance. And my goal is that this will kind of help foster longer term discussions about uh, how as a community moves forward, uh, security can be made easier to achieve by people who are deploying not only U-Boot, but some of the other firmware and, and boot solutions that are being discussed at this conference. I think as open source continues to you know, improve and, and be deployed throughout different technical um, application domains, I think the idea of making it easier to use software securely is something that we all uh, need to think about. Major theme in this talk and, and a lot of what I've been thinking about recently is uh, technical debt. And, and the idea here is that when you as a, a development team adopt some third party code, whether it be open source or some proprietary licensed uh, software package, you're essentially taking out a loan in the sense of you're getting functionality now that you can use, but you have to pay off that debt later in terms of investing in engineers' knowledge of that code base and understanding of it such that functional risk does not arise in terms of being able to um, fix bugs that might arise in that core code that you're not familiar with or being able to be agile with respect to changing requirements from customers. And security debt is kind of a similar concept to this. Um, it's the idea that you're adopting some code and not only may there be a code defects that represent security vulnerabilities, but there is a more nuanced type of security debt where functionality that's operating as written and as intended and as designed, um, but is inappropriately included in your product, perhaps unintentionally and unknowingly, um, can result in some security risks. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here today. You'll hear me referring to SOCs, system on a chip devices. These are application-specific microprocessors with some integrated peripherals. Uh, a cool example of this is the iMix 6 ULL, which I provided a link for here. Um, I see that a lot. Uh, there's newer uh, chips in that product line, the iMix 8, for instance. So a lot of what I work with is typically ARM-based platforms, sometimes MIPS or um, even PowerPC still in some automotive work, uh, typically less so in the x86 uh, in, in these embedded systems. So U-Boot probably doesn't require too much of an introduction, but um, I've highlighted here just some of the many reasons why I see a lot of organizations adopt it in their platforms. And one thing in particular is that silicon vendors now ship U-Boot in their board support packages, the, the software suites that are given to customers to get their products bootstrapped and off the ground. Oftentimes, uh, there'll be pre-built binaries as well as the modified source code and although secure boot is possible and you know that's supported in many ways, it still requires that product vendors invest time and effort into understanding these solutions and understanding how they fit into the bigger picture of their product in order to, for them to deploy it securely. 
Um, and I just want to kind of highlight what I mean when I say secure boot, because this can differ a bit then from what people might be familiar with on uh, x86 platforms. So within the space of SOCs, uh, secure boot typically refers to this flow of where we extend a hardware-backed root of trust from a trust anchor uh, all the way up through our application software. And through this process, every piece of data and code that is ingested and, and used is authenticated prior to its use. So within the SOC, we typically have a boot ROM, uh, which is an immutable program that it executes and then uses a public key uh, that is programmed into fuses or some other run one-time programmable memory region and that is used to authenticate the secondary program loader, uh, typically a smaller uh, stripped down version of U-Boot that's loaded into an external, excuse me, loaded into internal SRAM uh, that's then authenticated using that public key, the signature is verified, and then it's executed. And then we proceed to do the same process all the way through the boot chain. So through the, the next U-Boot proper, the, the bigger, more functional U-Boot up through the Linux kernel, and the idea is that it's critical that every single piece of data and code that is used is authenticated. And if any authentication fails, the device must fall into a safe state. Otherwise, we can undermine this chain of trust and compromise the platform. Now, uh, for uh, an audience that is you know, passionate about open software, the, an obvious question may be, doesn't this mean that we can't exercise our rights to recompile code and deploy it in products that, that use a secure boot flow? And the answer is kind of. Um, so in terms of the technology, these chipsets often have the ability to store multiple keys and to revoke keys. So the question of can we run our own code and, and you know put change and tweak the, the software in these systems that use secure boot uh, on SOCs ultimately comes to a question of whether the product vendor can be incentivized to provide a strong user-initiated unlock. Uh, I could think of unlocking your Android devices, for instance, and, and putting in a custom bootloader where uh, you can enroll user keys. And something like that could be, become important if a product is going to be used for a long period of time, and the utility of that product is going to extend past when the company decides to stop supporting that product. So uh, in terms of secure end of life plans for a product, um, the enrollment of user keys such that a community or uh, another organization can take on the role of pass providing security patches and updates may be very important and, and perhaps is a good argument for uh, providing user unlocks in a system and being able to enroll users uh, signing keys. So when we look at products that are using U-Boot, we typically start with thinking, what is our attack surface? Um, and in terms of the bootloader, it is a little bit larger traditionally than uh, what we might expect, uh, you know, depending on what functionality is available. And of course, the configuration is going to play a big role in this. But here, I'm providing just kind of a, a quick mental map at a high level. The UART console is traditionally the, the main point of entry that we have when we're doing security audits and trying to break into uh, the U-Boot environment so that we can instrument the platform to further perform security testing, uh, extract data, and so forth. So firmware dumping and data extraction is one uh, thing we're looking to do. So any traditional memory commands that are left in, um, oftentimes vendors will put custom diagnostic commands. So anywhere where there's a delta between the upstream U-Boot code base and some custom vendor commands is where we're going to focus looking for any new uh, defects or vulnerabilities that we can exploit. And another really interesting um, thing with, with the consoles is that oftentimes vendors will seek to remove things like the memory commands, memory display, memory modify, but they'll leave in commands that have optional address arguments that allow us to essentially abuse commands like CRC32 as an arbitrary read-write primitive. And I'll continue on later to talk a little bit more about that. When we have onboard peripheral interfaces that you know, data is being exchanged between different chips, any traffic flowing over those is fair game for an attacker, at least when uh, a physical and local threats are part of the threat model. So any way we can interpose communication and tamper with data, and maybe a, an opportunity for us to compromise the platform, especially if uh, pointers are commute, especially if pointers are uh, 
computed from you know offsets and ranges in, in traffic. As I've already mentioned, uh, any data that is loaded from external storage is certainly something we have to authenticate. But some other interesting uh, situations can arise where, for instance, a product vendor intends to use the default environment baked into the binary, but they do not remember to change their configuration to have the config and viz nowhere setting. So what essentially happens is we can inject an environment into a region of Flash uh, with a valid CRC and then can execute you know, commands uh, in the environment that way, even if maybe our console is not exposed through a boot delay configuration that allows us to get in. And then lastly, um, network interfaces are, of course, something that uh, is an area where we look. Um, if there's opportunities to force a platform to fall back into a network boot, I think a lot of um, Soho routers and things like that will often fall back to a TFTP mode. But we also do see that in other application domains where um, if a boot fail counter uh, hits hit so many times, it'll try to reach out to either an upstream system to fetch a new image, or perhaps it's left in from a developer uh, trying to download images from their machine via TFTP. And of course, uh, any relevant CDEs there are in some of the network stacks or things we're going to be looking for as uh, security um, assessment teams. And one really interesting thing about uh, U-Boot is, and usages of it we see in products, is that it's that kind of nuanced situation again where functionality operates as designed. Um, there's a lot of really awesome functional functionality in U-Boot that allows us to be effective in debugging and bringing up new platforms and developing support for new chipsets. But when that functionality is um, brought along for the ride into production systems, uh, that's when the uh, security risks can arise. So it's really a matter of uh, what the threat model is, what the expectations are from users in terms of the confidentiality of their data, the integrity and authenticity of the programs running, and um, the nature of the system in the greater context of you know, a, a application space uh, really defines what functionality becomes a security risk. And then often times in the uh, security community, people will say, you know, if an attacker has physical access to your system, it's already compromised. And I think that that that's kind of dated uh, and no longer has to be true. In 2020, we have plenty of SOCs with security features that allow us to be more resilient to physical and local threats than, you know, the the client desktop and server machines of the past. We, we have mechanisms like Secure Boot. Um, and so when we have systems that are deployed in unsupervised environments, think like LoRaWAN gateways, um, we, we want these systems to be resilient to physical threats. We don't want an attacker to be able to compromise that sort of system and then get access to network keys and so forth. Within the uh, commercial consumer goods space, there are lots of opportunities for someone to have physical access to a device that isn't just them breaking into your home, which would admittedly be a larger problem. Um, open box returns can be an interesting situation where someone tampers with the firmware on a device and then returns it to the store and they put it back on the shelf if it looks like it hasn't been, you know, messed with in any noticeable deg degree. And that sort of attack certainly isn't scalable, but it is plausible. Um, Something for consumers to think about is, you know, when they return a device and it has sensitive information on it about, you know, maybe recordings of them or uh, their location data, credentials, who in the reverse logistics chain and repair services um, processes has access to their data and how will that data be securely removed and who can access it? I oftentimes do see products that uh, data is not securely erased so that when it goes through um, RMA and warranty, you know, debugging and, and fixing and refurbishing, uh, that data still may reside on the, on the non-volatile storage in some erased region, or not erased, but rather the, the, the files uh, still reside in blocks. Um, there's lots of other situations here. You know, we rent vehicles and real estate now through mobile apps, um, and there's a, a growing awareness of some domestic abuse case scenarios with stalkerware, but also I refer to as stalkerware-esque misuse of functionality, so if functionality is not mindful of um, the real world implications of how people may abuse devices to harm one another. So 
lots of different opportunities for physical access. It does matter. Now, when we look at a product, it's sometimes easy to say, how could this vulnerability be present? How could they have forgotten to turn this functionality off? And I think, you know, where a lot of nuance and, you know, how I've come to realize how things can come to be in terms of security vulnerabilities is the complexity of modern um, supply chains. So on the left, we see U-Boot um, where the upstream source code resides. The, you know, this project is designed to have a lot of configurability. It's very portable and, and upholding the portability for all the different supported platforms is obviously one of the main goals of the project. And that's obviously a, a focus. And when you have something that's too configurable, you can't necessarily uh, tailor the security to any one specific threat model. That's kind of the, the user's job when they, or rather the engineering teams who are adopting it to a specific use case. When we see silicon vendors, um, they usually will take a fork of U-Boot and oftentimes old versions. Um, I've listed a couple here that I have seen, um, even some dated before the, the year month uh, scheme. And the silicon vendor's objective is to take U-Boot and apply it to one of their reference designs to demonstrate to the their customers how the functionality of the chip operates and to maximally demonstrate all the different capabilities so they can provide kind of working demo images that work out of the box and facilitate quick time to market for engineering teams using their chipsets. And then once uh, uh, one of their customers who may be the product vendor itself or one of their third party partners or suppliers, they're gonna be taking that and building platforms that uh, may be intended to be reused across different product variants. So they might try to either reuse a platform that they've created, or it may be the case that a product vendor is really only writing the application level software and they're relying on an OEM or another supplier to take care of all the hardware level um, design and implementation and providing the, the bootloader that they will get as oftentimes uh, a binary. I've seen situations where they don't even have source code, which obviously brings um, some licensing concerns to light. So it's the case that the product vendors we interface with when we're doing security assessments may not actually really know much about U-Boot and they only have like a basic understanding of how to configure the environment or, or they may not actually have invested time in understanding all the functionality in it. So then when we get to specific customers and end users, there's a specific threat model and there's use cases and scenarios of risk that present risk that they're concerned about. And those may not match uh, what the product vendor has provided or what was provided to that product vendor by um, their, their partners and suppliers. So in working with teams to identify gaps in their security posture and specifically with regard to U-Boot, something I have been working on was a project I named Death Charge um, to help me do security assessments more quickly and effectively and consistently. And what I had done was put together a collection of kind of my bag of tricks and some of the insights I've gained over the years and built some like memory app, memory access abstractions atop of command line primitives, which I'll mention a few shortly, and put together some binary analysis utility and put together some binary analysis utilities, um, such as things like allowing me to identify uh, the command tables in a uh, binary so I know what commands are in the environment. Um, in some cases, I've seen vendors put multiple command tables and you authenticate as to whether or not you have access to more privileged commands. And also some things are in depth charge allow me to find uh, device trees and things like that. So the source code and documentation are available there. Uh, this is originally published back in um, the end of the summer. And I had done a blog post and hardware.io webinar where I demonstrated using this toolkit to bypass the secure boot functionality in a smart speaker uh, via the I squared C command. So I was using that as an arbitrary rewrite primitive and then uh, corrupting some of the memory or rather overwriting pointers and things to allow me to uh, achieve a tethered route. And the goal with this project to that point had largely been um, allow me to develop proof of concept attacks and, and share them with uh, product teams in, especially in ways where they can be automated so they can easily see the issue and understand um, what's going on and why something is a risk rather than um, receiving like a three page, uh, you know, write up that is a lot of um, 
steps for them to follow. And in consulting, uh, time is money. So the idea that we can uh, find security gaps more quickly and then move on to higher impact issues that might be um, in terms of remote, the accessible attack surfaces once the operating system boots, um, that's really valuable to us. We want to be able to get to the point where we can instrument a platform and start looking at the, the security of the you know, application software. So compromising U-Boot isn't necessarily our goal, but rather a means to our end. But you know, compromising and bring compromising a platform and bringing security issues to light is only one half of the equation. And we have to fix those. We have to solve these problems. And so, in the version of Depth Charge I'm releasing uh, this week, um, I'm introducing a API and a tool that allow us to check and audit configurations in order to highlight any configuration options which may present risk. The things that typically have been the root causes for some of the security gaps um, facing some of the engineering teams that we work with. So the idea here is it's kind of similar to the kconfig harden check for uh, the Linux kernel configuration, but uh, adapting the ideas to uBoot. So we scan the .config file, or for older versions of uBoot, the platform configuration headers where the config items are defined, report potential risks in terms of their impact and, and um, you know what the uh, so what of the vulnerability is, so to speak. Um, and provide some high-level recommendations. Although I've included a set of built-in kind of initial checks, the idea is that this is extensible. It could be customized. So at runtime, you can register different security risk definitions and then handlers for when um, different entries are encountered in the configuration, either regular expression-based or function-based if you want to perform more logic. And the idea here is that teams can adapt this to the different silicon vendors or even their own customizations of U-Boot to prevent things from creeping back into their configuration that they previously identified as dangerous. So from here, um, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that I have traditionally encountered. And these are the sorts of things that we look for when auditing a U-Boot configuration and how we guide teams to avoid kind of pitfalls. So uh, pretty popular and well-known is fail open behavior of the boot command, the, the command that is run once a platform is, says, OK, it's time to boot, typically loading your kernel uh, device tree and then passing off execution of the kernel. So as noted in these two um, presentations that I've linked here, uh, if teams do not configure their boot command to have some sort of reset at the end of the sequence, um, if the kernel isn't executed so successfully, platform should reset rather than fail open into a command environment, which um, can be induced by uh, failures to load an image. So if you're able to corrupt an image header or um, otherwise some data that's integrity checked just by simply grounding an address or data line on a non-volatile storage device, um, you can often induce this sort of fail open behavior. So in terms of guidance, we often will encourage the use of something like we show in the reset here or otherwise disabling that um, the command interface entirely and instead moving towards a more pro pro programmatic approach um, where a reset is part of that code sequence. So in terms of uh, unexpected memory read-write primitives, we work with teams that will try to prune down the command set available in the console and you boot uh, to a limited set. And it's things like uh, CRC32, for instance, is a, a really interesting one that I thought uh, was kind of interesting to demonstrate and exploit for where there's an address where a checksum can be written to such that it can be you know, read from that address and compared against. And some teams didn't necessarily realize that this was indeed exploitable um, until they explained the process of how it's done. So in depth charge, I have what I call a reverse CRC32 hunter. And the idea here is that um, because the CRC32 polynomial is invertible for any of its four byte outputs, you can compute the necessary four byte input that is needed to you know, output that result. And then by walking that backwards in a chain and then using some lookup tables over sliding windows in an input corpus um, generated from memory contents, uh, you can essentially create arbitrary payloads. Um, so links here kind of go into that in more detail. Um, and of course, um, in terms of something like that, it, the solution is you know either to patch that code, if you need CRC32 to patch the code to remove it or otherwise disable that command tends to be the guidance. 
Another example of this was with, uh, I mentioned exploiting um, the, the I squared C command, which again can be used as a read write memory read write primitive based on the fact that the I2C read and I2C write commands do take SOC memory addresses. So um, you can see in these links here, if you want to take a look at the video or the blog post, uh, I talk a little bit about how we use a, an additional device we add to the I squared C bus to kind of use as a proxy for the data which we want to read or write from the system. And beyond just including commands that uh, may not be appropriate for a specific use case or a threat model, uh, you know, patching is always something that find organizations have trouble with, and not only just patching, but uh, keeping track of the way a code base evolves over time. So when we talked about the software supply chain and getting um, you know, the U-boot builds as part of BSPs, there may be huge gaps in between the different versions that are released. Rather than keeping up and updating their bootloader over the course of a product, a team may only update U-boot when they move on to the, their next product and have the newest version of a BSP from a, a there's a silicon vendor, and you know they may be jumping years at a time. And changes where there might be like semantics differences or important things to note um, can kind of bite uh, these teams when, when they're kind of, I like to say, engineering on borrowed time. So a really interesting example was when the semantics of the boot delay check, which um, traditionally boot delay zero with the config zero boot delay check option disabled would prevent one from interrupting the boot sequence with uh, a keystroke on the UART interface. Um, but that had changed um, to kind of simplify the semantics a little bit, as you know, shown in this little screenshot that's you know, well documented. Um, but what would happen is teams would overlook this important change set um, because they're not reviewing things in that level of detail. And so by having the semantics change and a option disappear, they would be left with the boot delay zero option, even though negative two is what they would have now wanted instead. So it's just kind of an interesting um, thing to think about as if you're proposing changes to code and semantics are ever changing, um, it might be important to think about um, you know, how easily will people um, realize the need to make this change. In this case, you know, it was very well documented. All the def configs changed. So I mean, it's on the, the users, but and when I say users, I mean product engineering teams, but something interesting to think about, I think. Another pitfall uh, teams encounter is when they adopt functionality that's in tree, but it doesn't necessarily match the current state of the art in terms of product security requirements or threat models. As we all know, cryptographic algorithms uh, you know, change over time and what, what's appropriate yesterday may not be appropriate today. And I do see teams using the config auto boot stop string SHA-256, which essentially password protects access to the console. But in general, we strongly discourage the use of product-wide passwords because this creates a break once, run everywhere failure mode where if an attacker has access to a platform or maybe the image from uh, like an updater, they could extract the hash and then go try to crack that hash on their GPU or FPGA farm. So that would then allow them to uh, access any platform that's using that password rather than if one is using a device unique secret that at least limits the compromise to a single device. So for that reason, we nowadays are encouraging device unique um, authentication mechanisms, preferably some sort of asymmetric crypto uh, with a child response. Um, and beyond just that, um, you know, SHA-256, especially single round unsalted is something um, we encourage no longer using, so we discourage. Um, in the past, S-Crypt or B-Crypt are better options, but nowadays, uh, you know, Argon2 is a, is a popular option. And then there are some other implementation considerations to take into account. Things like uh, glitching attacks are becoming uh, lower cost and easier to perform with you know, as the state of the art advances. So you've probably gleaned um, a lot of what we do in terms of guidance is encouraging teams to disable functionality. So coming from uh, a reference design where everything's enabled, ultimately the process is to disable things uh, that are we regard as, um, you know, excessive or overly permissive. So some discussion prompt questions uh, like I listed here, are things one can 
ask a team to prompt them to identify excessive um, permissive functionality or things that otherwise increase the attack surface of the platform. So looking for um, symbol names or configuration options that aren't immediately familiar to them as you know, what requirements those are fulfilling. And then when looking at how requirements are being fulfilled by certain functionality, um, there's always a question of, are we fulfilling this uh, requirement in a way that follows the principle of least privileged necessary. So I always kind of like to think of the movie Spaceballs when Lone Star says, take only what you need to survive. So when you're moving to production, you know, don't carry along all that extra baggage. The problem with this, though, is telling a team to just disable something is not always actionable. Um, security assessments are unfortunately often performed too retroactively. So if the product's already done, or even if it's already shipping, um, there may already be reliance on some functionality regarded as dangerous with regards to in-field servicing and diagnostics, the um, return handling of you know, failed units, or um, some testing in the factory. So ultimately, um, we as security practitioners are trying to move towards more proactive security requirements definitions, um, evaluating criteria at the design phase, to identify what functionality and customizations in a bootloader are required, and then try to you know, define how those features and functionality should be implemented securely. And for a lot of teams, especially those that traditionally haven't been directly interacting with U-Boot, um, and they'll rely on their suppliers and vendors, it requires that they get their hands dirty and start prototyping and, and engaging the community, reading the mailing list, and so on. So uh, to kind of wrap things up, um, some things that I think the path forward in terms of working with teams to use U-Boot more securely and deploy it more security, securely in their products. Um, there's a really excellent white paper um, from the F -Secure hardware security team that uh, discusses some of the best practices and notes some of the pitfalls that I mentioned here. I think more in the way of best practice guidance and more security by example in terms of reference and limitations that demonstrate kind of a hardened configuration would be really helpful. And uh, you know, kudos to the F-Secure team for that white paper and also for their work on the USB Armory platforms. Um, that's one I often point to uh, because it's one of the few in-tree platforms that can disable the command line easily and demonstrates ex implementing the ROAR, uh, excuse me, and demonstrates implementing the board run command uh, function that you can use if you don't have the command line enabled. And finally, I think Perhaps one of the biggest needs I see from engineering teams is some sort of standardized authenticated access mechanism that uses modern asymmetric cryptographic algorithms. Uh, it works with device unique secrets and um, is auditable in the sense that we can know whether devices have been unlocked in the past, um, such that if someone had tampered with the device or if you were going to buy a used device, you may not want one that's been uh, user unlocked with modified software and user signed keys, for instance. And a colleague of mine, Sultan, published a really awesome white paper um, on for microcontroller security, but uh, the section entitled Implementing Secure Bootloaders Authenticated Access kind of further outlines what such a mechanism would look like and kind of outlines some of the requirements for it. And with that, um, ready to take on some uh, questions and discussion. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending this talk. And if you'd like to read more about the project uh, depth charts that I've been working on, um, these links here will direct you to the project and some of the reading materials about it. Thank you.